Holly Shippers. I'm manager of seasonal department, and to my right is... I am Sarah Christofferson. Um, I'm in the seasonal department with Holly, and I also plant up all the pre-made containers that we have for sale. It's been a while since we've done this. You ready? Yeah. <laughs> We're not used to actual people in front of us. We've been doing it in front of a camera. We're used this thing. <laughs> Today we're talking about cool weather vegetables. What is a cool weather vegetable? It's a plant that does well in a cool temperature. It benefits from cool temperatures. Will it grow in a warm condition? Of course, but it won't produce or taste well. A lot of times with the with the cool weather crops, they once it gets warm, they tend to get more bitter, mm -hmm. um, not as tender. Especially lettuce, yeah. Yeah, lettuce yeah, yeah. especially. Yeah. Um, and, and part of the, the handout there, there are some, some groupings of plants. Um, gives you a good idea of which ones are the cool weather crops if you don't already know. Um, things like tomatoes, peppers, those will be discussed in our, our yeah, warm, warm weather, weather crop in a couple, couple of months. Yeah, yeah. I, didn't, I didn't I didn't. I didn't check that date. No. Anyway, it'll be coming up. <laughs> um, and then we'll if, be there. if you want a um, color version of this printout, you can go to our website to the classes and, and find it there. Let's talk about some of these cool weather plants. One of my favorites, peas. This yeah. is a tendril pea or a garnish pea. It's so tasty. We have two different varieties. Uh, part of it is to, um, mm. and you can see, well maybe you can see, it's got a lot of little tendrils. It's um, main purpose is to eat the tendrils and the, and the fresh shoots. So you can you know cut a few inches of the fresh shoots and put them in your salads, stir fry them. Tastes just like a fresh pea. Um, the peas that it grows are also edible. And it's usually a snow pea that grows as a tendril or garnish pea because they grow so much faster. So just kind of a you fun little different thing. Oh, you can you can okay. chew. All right. oh. <laughs> <laughs> They're great in salads. I put them in sandwiches. I just I love them. I just I'll, I'll be out watering my veggie patch. And I'll be eating them. It's fun to have those unexpected yeah. things. That this is a, a patio pride dwarf uh, snow pea. So great in a container if you're limited on space. It might grow and kind of flop over the edges a little bit, but it's not something that's going to grow four feet tall and, and need something yeah. to climb necessarily. And it's a snow pea. I'm going to talk about all the peas because I love peas. This is a sugar sprint pea. It's a snap pea. My favorite are snap peas because they're so fat and juicy. Does everybody so know the difference between snow and snap peas? No. no. Snows are the flat ones you do for stir fries or just eat as in or put in your salads. Uh, snaps are big, fat, juicy, yummy. So you get the fully formed peas in there, but you can eat the whole pod as yeah, well. just chew it And up. then ones that you don't want to eat the pod are shelling peas. We sometimes get them in. They're hard them, to come by. I get them in maybe once. Yeah. But, I mean, really, you could do that with a snap pea, too, if mm -hmm. you wanted to. Yeah. This is radicchio. I've got a couple different kinds of radicchio. You basically use it like you do uh, lettuce. You put it in salad sandwiches, just eat it as is. That's up to you. What is the flavor profile on that? Is it sweet? Some can be a little bit bitter. bitter, some can be uh, uh, sweet. So it depends on which one. This is, um, this is a lettuce mix. This is musclin. Uh, a little bit spicy. They usually have some lettuce, some mustard. A mix of everything, yeah. Sometimes we'll get some bok choy in there. This is a uh, camo oak leaf mix. I like to get, <laughs> it just looks very mixed. There's two, one one extra different mix. one. It's a mix. <laughs> I like to get mixes because they give you such a, a an extra, um, you know, you get a little of everything. A little nicer flavor of all, all your mixes. You know, most people are so used to just the few varieties that are available in a, a grocery store. There are so many choices yeah. out there. Um, of course, the tags can give you some good information. There's you know different romaines types. You can get speckly romaines. You can get red romaines. You can get um, different different uh, butter crunches. Yep. Different leaf lettuces. And I, I like to get the mixes of both the mescaline and the lettuce and just mix it all yeah, up. We don't usually carry a lot flavors. of heading lettuce because it just doesn't do real great here. And once you get a slug eating that, they've kind of ruined the whole head. Mm -hmm. So um, we prefer. Um, we'll talk more, about slugs later on. Yes, we will. We'll prefer more <laughs> leaf lettuce where you can, and w w with a leaf lettuce, um, you can harvest the outside leaves and leave the little small ones in to grow. So you're getting a lot of harvest off of it instead of just cutting the whole thing like you do with the head lettuce. Now this is winter boar kale. 
You can do like dried kale chips. Um, I, I juice it. Make sure your blade's sharp because it will wear on that battery. When they're mature, they're pretty tough. Lassionado, very popular one. Uh, again, one that's good for uh, chips or juicing or stir frying. I've, I've used it in soups. If you hear someone say dinosaur kale, that's what they're referring yeah, to. Yeah. It's kind of nice and lumpy and kind of cool looking. Kohlrabi, beautiful, beautiful uh -huh. bulb that you would uh, stir fry, eat raw, use in soups. It's fun to grow because that bulb grows above ground so you can watch it grow. Mm -hmm. And there are purple varieties that so make them even more interesting. This is pak choy, also known as bok choy. It just depends on what part of China you're in, on, on what it's called. It's the same stuff. Uh, great in stir fries. Over here is Swiss chard. I grew up with Swiss chard as something that we just stir fried and put a little butter and salt and pepper on. Swiss chard is a nice one too as far as, as your um, leafy greens go because it's a it's a biennial. It'll live all season and then the following season it will go to flower. But it means that instead of like a lettuce that really kind of frizzles out in the heat, it's going to keep going. It might be a little bit more bitter, but then come cooler season in the fall, you're still, still harvesting off of that same plant. This is an artichoke. This one's green globe. I love using artichokes. I have grown this one. I love using it to, if you have a gas stove, I grill it on top of that. And then I salt and pepper and olive oil it and stick it in the oven a little bit. Oh, it's delicious. Mm. I love it. Horseradish. I love horseradish, but it doesn't love gardens. You want to put it in a container, not in the ground, unless it can go wild. I had it in the ground on this side of the driveway. Now it's on this side of the driveway, and it's in my back 40. That's in 31 years of time, but it's enough to be everywhere. <laughs> so containerize. Uh, great for making horseradish sauce and for beefs and whatever you want to put horseradish on. It's awesome. I love horseradish. I like the hot and spiciness of it. Uh, beets. Bull's blood is very popular. It's your traditional juicy red beet. But you also have nice red <coughs> leaves, which is really pretty in the garden and also edible. Mm -hmm. Great for roasting. <coughs> Canning. If you're into canning, this is a red ace, another popular one, and it's another traditional red beet. Uh, again, good for roasting and soups. Roasting and, what did I say before? Canning. Canning. <laughs> <laughs> Turnips. This is a, a salad turnip, and if you harvest it uh, young, it's nice and sweet. It's a very white, beautiful turnip. Great for stews, soups. All kinds of stuff. I think that's my plants. Is it? Oh, asparagus. Doesn't look much like much of anything yet. <laughs> They're not doing anything yet. <laughs> we do have the green and the purple, um, and we'll get into planting asparagus a little a little later on. And we can talk about it now. Yeah. Okay. Um, when we get these, are they like a two-year-old plant? They're usually a two-year-old. Sometimes three, but usually a two-year-old plant. Um, you, when you plant these, you want to do a trench about six, eight inches deep, plant them about a foot apart, <coughs> put them in, cover them up, and as the asparagus grows, you're filling in, filling in. Um, you do not want to harvest the first year. They need to have at least those three years. They need to establish the root system. And when you... That asparagus spear that comes up will then grow up and be its leaves to be able to feed and store energy. So you need to leave those the first year while it's settling in so it can feed itself and really um, grow roots and everything. And, and, when, and when you do go to harvest, when it is time to harvest, don't harvest everything. Each crown needs to have at least one left. Okay, that's all my goodies. Let's see, what do I have? I have some celery. This, this is a Chinese pink celery. It's um, really fun. It does have um, pink, pink stems and in turn pink stalks once it gets big. Um, the thing that I realized when growing celery is it, the, stuff, the different varieties that you can grow in your garden are so much more flavorful than what you buy in the store. 
Um, and there are ways, and I'm not gonna get way into it, there are ways that you can do things to, to blanch them, um, so you can have that real light colored stock um, that's tender, but just eat them. You don't have to do just that. Eat you can just. Um, we ended up using you know way less in dishes because it just had so much flavor and it was it was really fun because you could get the different colors and, and varieties. Um, and it tastes just like celery. How close can you plant that together? Well, your clump's gonna get about that big big around. Oh wow! Yeah. At the at the base. At my, the base. Uh-huh. My plants were pretty pretty good size. Oh wow! Um. That's because you keep your plants happy. <laughs> food. Um, Utah, did you want to say anything specific about Utah? It's just your, the, it's just your, tradi- your tr- traditional green celery that you'd get in the grocery store. So if you want the type of, like the grocery store, Utah is going to be the closest? Yeah. Okay. yeah. Um, she has she has 30 plus years of experience with this. I'm, I'm a newbie in comparison. Are you aging so. me? <laughs> <laughs> I bounce around from different professions, so. That's your way of saying you're younger. <laughs> um, and then we have some things that are a little bit different, things you may not be familiar with, like the, I mean, you know. Celeratic. Celeriac? Celeriac. Celeriac. <laughs> you brushed up on me. <laughs> um, it's great, great in a stir fry. Mm-hmm. You can eat them raw if you want to, or can so, them. What's the, what is it? Celeria. It's from celery. It's it's from a it's the celery is one of its parents. Okay. Yeah. Are you still eating the stock? You're eating the the bulb. Bulb. Okay. Yeah, you're eating the. That's bulb. the difference. I'm like okay. there was something. I knew there was. I didn't something know what different. you were asking. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, it makes a a bulb down down at the at the base. Yeah. And you just peel it and cut it up and do what you want with it. It's it's it's, it's delicious. And then another one that we have is is uh, Celtus. So um, Celtus cross between uh, celery and lettuce. So you, you can eat the, the greens that are on the top, but it also makes a stock that's el- el- edible. Edible. Carrie was grazing on this yesterday. <laughs> she, she she really enjoyed it. <laughs> we're, we're, we're snacking on our we our snack. <laughs> Um, cabbages. There, there are a lot of different cabbages you can choose from. Um, we do see a lot of different varieties of cabbage in the grocery store, but of course you can grow their, your own, and they're generally fresher and more nutritious. Um, also, I love growing the the purple cabbages in in my you know dispersed in my garden because they're so big and bold and beautiful. You grow them for the color. <laughs> kind of do. I kind of do. You don't cook. <laughs> Oh. I can Ouch. eat them. Shots fired. Oh, Ouch. I don't cook. It's true. I have other interests. Wait till the herb class. She's gonna learn to cook. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's why. That's why I'm with the chef. Gonna, I gotta be freed up to do other things. Um, yeah, so we've got several cabbage. I don't think we need to and go this, through lots of varieties. And this one's not your traditional. It grows kind of oval or pointy. Like a candy red. Yeah. Not not necessarily round. Uh, maybe maybe a little bit more looking like a savoy cabbage. Yeah. Yeah. How do you uh, keep the green worms out of cabbage? Uh, oh, we will get there. <laughs> we, we, we will we get there. We have a section for that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, those pretty little white moths with the little black dot. Those are what you don't want around. They're European, just <laughs> like the brassica group, which is the cabbages and the kales yep. and those things. So they came with the with the produce that we have, and, and they're the ones that lay them. eggs, <laughs> and and we get those little green worms. And we will talk about how to avoid some of that and also um, get rid of those buggers. Um, cauliflower. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm reading her little note on here. <laughs> Stick type. It's, that's, the, that's the type it's called, is a stick type. So it's Song TJ-65 Cauliflower. And it grows kind of like the sticks, like sticks with tops all mm. over. Kind of like a broccolini grows. Mm. So and it's lots very, of smaller heads. Very sweet. The stem is very sweet. Mm-hmm. Um, another fun one of the cauliflowers is the, um, the Vita Verde. Mm-hmm. It's, it's green. And it kind of 
It reminds me of a sea urchin for some reason. <laughs> yeah. No? I always do it. I always do it. <laughs> well, let's see. We have some broccoli. I think for the most part, we, we know what, you know, a, a, our main big broccoli head looks like. But there are other ones that, like this cauliflower, send up lots of smaller shoots. This is the burgundy one. Is artwork? Artwork's a really good head. That's a, a bigger head? Artwork is, a, is a, a head broccoli that when you cut that main head off, then it'll give you shoots. So you get some more afterwards. Mm. Do we have anything else that we need to... That's more cauliflower. And we just have this fun burgundy broccoli. It's going to grow the same, same similar way as the... Um, Artwork, it will grow the head and then the shoots. Did you bring another rhubarb? I did not. Ooh, we we got, forgot the rhubarb, but rhubarb, another cool weather crop. We do have gallon plants out there. I didn't bring everything in or they wouldn't be able to sit in here. That's probably true. <laughs> and then I, I've got just a few examples of like easy plant ups. Um, this is um, a lettuce bowl, so um, I just have six different varieties in there. You know, usually, besides the mixes that you can get, um, you know, a lot of times you get a six pack and it's all the same. Um, I have done done this. I bought several six packs before and planted up um, different bowls to give us gifts. So then I have a variety, and then my friends have a variety, and uh, we all have and fun then making salads. They sold to his friends, and they told I dated myself on that. Too. <laughs> <laughs> and this one, I put three different kales in the center. They're gonna, you know, first get up tall. And then I've got a couple lettuces and a spinach that, as this the these guys get taller and bigger leaves, they're going to help shade these little guys some. And the lettuces and spinach are definitely cool weather crops that, as it gets warmer, a little bit of shade is going to help them out and help them um, go a little bit farther before they send up flower shoots. And you will find that some lettuces will go through the entire winter into spring, but they are bitter when they do that. Okay. Any questions on like what may, may or may not be a cool weather crop? Uh, I was just wondering if you could recommend on the um, beans and potatoes what um, type to buy to plant. A blue blue lake is always a good one. Kentucky, those are the primary ones that I bring in. Potatoes are you know it, they vary with each year on what's available, but I always bring in uh, a Yukon type. And S a, Satina is the Yukon type that for we now. Have. And then um, a russet type, I always bring in a fingerling, a purple, a red, and a white. And to this year's Kelly. And the ones white. that we have are all the ones that grow well here. Yeah. 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 What is the difference between using this and starting seeds right now? The difference would be two to three weeks. You get a little more of a head start getting them yeah. already started. And one of the things in the handout that I did put in there was a little um, chart of some of the things that grow easily and quickly from seed that you could just start in the ground now and, and get a harvest from. The things that I didn't list are, are things that maybe take a little bit longer and I would recommend starts at this point um, so they're doing doing what they need to do before it gets too long. Okay. Yeah, we didn't, we came in late. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Uh, I haven't had any broccolinis available yet, um, so I'm not sure what is out, what will be out. Uh, there's so many different varieties, I just don't know what they're going to put out for me to order from. And we do buy from local growers who are growing things that work well in this, this yeah, area. Yeah, so I bring plants in weekly. You know, you can give me a call. My order days are Saturdays and Sundays, so by, by then I will know what I'm bringing in for that week. And if, like late Friday or Saturday is really when we have the most of what we're going to have because we've gotten the deliveries in during the week. And we for sure make sure we're set up for the weekends. We went to carrots in the sweets. Oh god, there's, uh, fingerlings are very sweet. Um, the bigger the carrot gets, the less sweet they become. They get a little more woody. Yeah, so harvesting them yeah. when they're still young. Yeah. Um, in fact, um, just to touch on carrots, carrots are one that um, here, are I mean, we, we're, we're feeling pretty warm <laughs> now. I don't know yeah. exactly what the temperature's going to do. Certainly, um, April is a good t would be a good time to yeah. seed them. Um, they need to stay real moist until they germinate. 
So um, what I learned online and worked really well um, was to, to seed them, press, press them in and water them into the soil and then put a board over it so it's staying dark and moist under there until I'm seeing them growing and then I take the board off. And those are something you're always going to do as seed. I will never bring them in pre-planted. They need to be by seed. You're just destroying their roots. You're stressing them. Yeah. When you have to we we want a nice big big tap root on there. So yeah. if, if if you're trying to separate them and grow them from, from a start, there's a real yeah. good chance you're going to damage those yeah. roots. And Yes. Um, I can get some printed up. <laughs> yeah, we'll need, we'll need a handout. Okay. Nope. Other can you print a bunch of handouts? Um, in, in containers? Yeah. And, and we will, we'll go over that. Okay. We'll, we'll go over planting into containers and wet varieties, but okay. there are things like, um, what was the name of that pea patio something? Yeah. There, there are things that like, if it has patio in the name, it's going to be a smaller You know it's going to be for a container. Um, or dwarf. Those things do well in containers because they just don't get as big. Um, I do all my gardening in containers. That's where my light is. It's in my driveway. Um, so we'll, we'll cover so, container planting. Yeah. Like you can grow any of these in a container. It just depends on what size container. Yeah. When we get into warm weather, you can't do corn. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm rhubarb. Um, do new plants start out as green and go to red? Or we carry varieties? a variety right now called Victoria, and when it's young, it'll start out green, and then as it matures, it gets a little red blush, but it will never be solid red. Yeah, I don't know what variety we have, but they've been green. There yeah. are green ones, too. There are a lot of different varieties. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, the last few years, We've Victoria just, yeah. is the only one that's been available to us. I found crimson for next year, hopefully. <laughs> so yeah, red is really pretty. Um, green doesn't mean it doesn't taste good. But the important good. thing is the flavor. Yeah. yeah. Speaking of snacking, arugula. Yeah. Arugula. What about, arugula. What about it? Arugula. On on just. Yeah. Just general. Just, just on what you would use it for. You just use it in salads or sandwiches or just eat as is. Yeah. You know, it's just a taste preference and what you want. To <clears throat> um, I don't a have arugula in right now. It has just become available, so hopefully next week I'll have it in. Okay, thank you. Yes? Is spinach kind of like lettuce where you clip it and it just keeps growing for the season? Or? Yes. Yeah. Well, it's, well, it's cool. And, mm -hmm. and we always recommend if you just need a little bit, don't cut it all off. Just cut the amount of leaves that you need. Mm -hmm. Can you define cool weather? <laughs> Cool weather is lower temperatures below 60, 55, 60, and warm weather we'll get into on warm weather. Yeah, as, as an example, the warm weather things like the tomatoes and the peppers and things like that want to be over 50 degrees. So there are warm weather crops or things that once our nighttime temperatures are, are above 50, it's going to be staying warm enough for them. Cool weather crops do better before that when it's when it's and most cool of these right can take like a light frost and some of them can Around completely go over degrees. the winter. I'm still harvesting spinach that I planted in the fall. Yes. Um, can you recommend some mustards? We have a dragon series in now that's delicious. It's very spicy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's so many mustards. Uh, I try to bring different in with each year just so we can experience them differently. This is a really nice one. Yeah, and after after the the class. Um, it's actually my day off. I won't be here, but, but Holly and others will be in the department I'm to, to help you find the different varieties and stuff and talk about different varieties. Yeah. Cool. Um, so let's get into choosing a growing site for your cool weather. How about we crops. talk about annuals and perennials and biannuals first? Since we're talking about plants. <laughs> All right. Makes sense. Let's do that. <laughs> uh, cool weather, uh, cool, cool weather, cool weather temperatures. Cool weather plants um, can consist of annuals, perennials, biannuals. Annuals will give you a crop for that season, and then the next planting uh, season you'll have to replace that plant. Perennials, of course, come back every year, produce every year. Uh, biannuals will produce the first season, the second season will flower, produce seeds, and that will be your next season's uh, seed. So if you're wanting to do seed collecting, Something like a carrot is a biennial. It, um, you will want to leave a few in over winter, so then next season 
they can flower and set seed and you can gather those seeds. Um, if you're not into to seed starting, just make sure you're eating them all this season. And that can be into the winter. You can leave them in the ground and um, when it gets cold again and pull them out as needed. But you know, if you go into the spring, they're going to be using that stored energy that's in that nice big fat root to make their flower and bloom. And yeah, then, just, then the carrot itself is not, the it's going to be The important thing is, woody. To, is to remember to leave some. <laughs> yeah. So, um, again, the, there's charts in there that, that, and it's not exact. I'm just going to say it's a little bit hard to say, oh, kale is an annual. Well, there's actually perennial kale. Um, there are different, you know, potatoes. If you leave a potato in the ground, there's it's going to sprout. Yeah. However, here with our wet winters, they, move, they generally she... rot, and if they do grow, they're not going to be the strongest plant, so I put them in the annual section. Yeah. So it's not a hard and fast rule. I basically put them in the sections for how we grow them here generally. Okay, picking your site. Is it sunny? Is it shady? What, what are you going to grow? What do you need? Is it going to be in the ground? Is it going to be in a container? Is it going to be in a raised bed? Those are all the things you need to consider. You know what you're growing, where the lighting is, what kind of lighting it needs, and, and what area you're going to live. In general, ve veggie plants need some sun. Um, full sun is six plus hours. Uh, part sun is three to six hours. There are some of these that will do well in that three to six hours and maybe even would prefer to be in morning sun over afternoon. Um, so you get more out of them as it gets warmer outside. Um, lettuce and spinach are a great example of this, um, and I touched on it in the handout, but um, one of the things I, I have found that I like doing is to uh, either plant in an area where it's not shaded yet this time of year, though maybe you have deciduous trees that haven't put their leaves out yet, and they're getting some sun while it's cooler and they're getting established, and then as, as we get warmer, then the trees are leafing out, and giving them a little bit of shade, which keeps them some nice and tender and and not going to flower as soon. Um, another example would be maybe putting up a trellis, planting some peas or beans that get nice and tall, and planting your spinach and lettuce behind it as far as from where the sun's coming from. So as it gets warmer, those peas are growing up and shading them. So as long as they're getting a decent amount of sun as they're getting established, they getting some, them some sun protection later in the season helps prolong your harvest. And what I do, like I mentioned earlier, I'm a container gardener uh, for my veggies. I have maples, Japanese maples in pots as well, and I pull them into the areas that I need to have added shade or, or filtered light. So a little bit of thinking outside the box. Um, what, what can you do to kind of give them those conditions? Um, and, Another thing that works really great, and this, I'm jumping ahead to companion planting. We're gonna get there. We'll get there. But, <laughs> but so impatient. Things like peas and beans are legumes. Legumes take nitrogen from the air. You can take all the away from companion. I know. I'll probably say this again. And then it puts um, nitrogen down in the root zone for itself to use and for neighboring plants to use. And then, um, there's like a symbiotic relationship with the bacteria that goes on where they, they grow little nodules on their roots that are just little nitrogen bombs. And um, so when I'm done with peas and beans and I'm taking them out of my garden, I cut them off and leave the root zone, roots in there. Hmm. So they're gonna decompose and those little nodules are gonna put nitrogen into your soil. Nitrogen gives you leafy green growth. And a lot of these, we want that leafy green growth. So I've had the biggest, most vigorous lettuce ever when I planted it with, with peas. Brighter. <laughs> it worked, I wanna share. So your amendments, if you're planting in the ground, I would recommend either using compost or soil booster. Compost, and there's gonna be a quiz at the end here. Compost <laughs> is chicken manure, kelp, bat guano, um, worm castings and alfalfa. Alfalfa is nitrogen and protein that's added, to, it adds to that to help break down uh, organic matter. And it also has a lot of organic matter in it. So if you're, you've got a new planting site, you haven't amended the soil, a lot of us around here have a lot of clay 
Um, some people have a lot of sand. This is going to add organic matter into it. That's going to help um, <coughs> fluff up your soil. It's going to help with water retention. It's going to help with water drainage. <laughs> and it's going to help put nutrients into your soil that your plants will then use and give you food that has good, good nutrition in it. Soil booster, kelp, chicken manure, worm castings, bat guano, seabird feathers for protein and nitrogen to help break down organic matter. Mm. So um, soil booster is a great one. If you've had soil, you've been working on, you've been planting uh, veggies or whatever in there, veggies being very hungry feeders, they take a lot out of your soil. Soil booster is something that you can top dress or mix in to put some of that nutrition back in. You don't have to use as much of it as a compost with like raw soil that hasn't been amended. It kind of just helps you put that stuff back in that maybe you used the, the plants used up the last season. So ultimate or also known as 420, depending what bags they have in stock. Worm castings, bat guano, seabird guano, and beneficial microbes, which help break down organic matter. <laughs> Raised bed. Raised bed is chicken manure, worm castings, mycorrhizae, and microbes. Microbes, we just discussed organic matter breakdown. Mycorrhizae, myco, fungi, rhizae, beneficial roots. So these are going to help your plant create good, strong root system and grow healthy and strong. This is another symbiotic relationship. They grow on the roots, extend the roots, help help the roots take up what they need and in turn they're getting sugars and stuff from from, from the plant from the roots so they they work together to help each other out um, I I did some raised beds in in my last yard used strictly the raised bed with fertilizers I loved it it was so nice to grow a plant in stayed stayed soft and lofty my plants grew great um, uh, but with a smaller container you might consider using um, ultimate recipe because uh, it has just it's just packed with goodies I for use, these hung, hungry feeders. I use ultimate. I mix for most of my veggies. I mix 50/50 with the Edna's potting soil with my tomatoes and my peppers. They're like it a little hotter. I I, I go with this. Yeah, they're similar. This. this one just has a little extra oomph as far as the the. And that oomph makes a difference. Organic fertilizers. And okay, stuff. we're off balance. If you're, if you're <laughs> off balance. <laughs> so what do all these have in common? Backwano. Yeah. Poop. Yeah, there you go. Poop. <laughs> um, that is very important. It adds the nutrients to the soil, which is your. Uh, your nitrogen, your phosphorus, and your potassium. Very important for plants. So how deep do you work that in? Uh, it depends on what you're planting and how deep the root system's going to go. So you just mix everything in. You um, can do 8 to 10 inches or... Um, but also things like carrots. If you're wanting to grow long carrots, yeah, you're going to need loose, how big they go. loose yeah. um, yummy soil pretty deep down. But there are carrots that are little round guys. If you have like hard soil um, or you want to kind of a quick crop, there there are also um, shorter carrots. So you don't have to have this much loose, fluffy soil to grow carrots. Just grow shorter ones, um, and they're 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 just as yummy. <laughs> just remember, the manure is very important. Is, is sand a good element to add for carrots to loosen up soil more? I mean, I've done. I prefer done compost. Oh, yeah, compost would be better than well, sand. Well, not only sand. Yeah. But it is. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. No. I know. I just use compost. Compost does, does. Whatever it, those amendments do, what? plus adding nutrition. I mean, how and, 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 and it keeps it fluffy. How to avoid the pair of hand carrots? <laughs> compost. No, no rocks. <laughs> compost and no rocks. You don't want hard, compacted soil. Yeah. Uh, but the compost is going to do that. If you have if you have really sandy soil, it's gonna add organic matter that's going to put food in there, and it's gonna gonna help um, keep water from draining too fast through it. But if you have really hard clay soil, it's going to loosen it up, yeah. put some nutrition in it. So whatever your soil is, compost is gonna help. Compost it. is always gonna be the, the answer. Yes. What do you do if your soil is so terrible that you need like a truckload of something to get started? Well, I get a good compost. You have to ask them what's in it, um, what they've mixed in it. Everybody has their own recipe. 
Otherwise, yeah. otherwise we sell bales, 2.8 cubic feet bales of compost. No, I, I'm not going to name individual companies. No, I, they all I, I bought um, a dump truck load of one that of soil that I loved. It was amazing. The next season, I got another dump truck load. Yeah. I couldn't get anything to grow it. It changes every year. And it was supposedly thing. the same thing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So it can it can be tricky. Um, or consider, you know, if if you really don't want to go through all of the um, trying to fix the soil or it's really compacted or has a lot of gravel, consider doing a raised bed and using the using raised beds. This is a bag, but we also have bales that are compressed, get, making it um, more economical to, to use. They're heavy, um, but if, if you can, can handle that, the, the big square bales are going to give you a lot more. And to add to that, as you're putting, did you have a question? Just, you can do, you can just use the ultimate. I just use the ultimate. So you don't put like that. I don't worry about that. But if you want to, you can put a little compost on top. Mm-hmm. How about leaves? Leaves would work? Sure. Yeah. Um, we just got a couple containers and they're two feet tall because um, I'm going to need to be able to sit and be able to work the beds. Mm-hmm. How do you... What do you do? I mean, obviously we don't need two feet of dirt. It depends on what you're growing. Right, but if we're growing... If you're growing tomatoes, that, that's almost not enough because they like a lot of root I, space. I personally fill all of my pots. Yeah. If you, if you have um, a container like this, but you fill it up with something that's not soil, and then you just have so- soil here, it's going to be very wet here. Mm. If you if you have everything soil, it's going to be wet, really wet down here. We don't want um, roots rotting uh, because the the, the 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 soil acts as a sponge and it makes it really wet right where the soil ends. Um, but also, it's limited on how far down the roots can can reach to get nutrition. Um, and you're also going to end up watering a lot more because it's going to dry out a lot faster. Now, if I had a pot like this, I might put something in the bottom, but two feet. I'm filling it completely with soil. Yeah, okay. Yeah, it's uh, and make sure you're well drained. Six, feet, six feet by three feet by two feet. I'd use the raised bed bales. Yeah. The bales. Yeah. 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 So, and and at that point, once you have that full, then the following seasons you can do something like adding soil booster and you know it's going to deplete a little more, bit. Or even more. Or even bed. more raised yeah. bed. You know, just topping it off. But once you get it filled the first time. It will break down and reduce a, a bit, but then you can just top it off. You won't have to replace it right. all. And just remember, each season you're going to want to add more rotate. more soil and rotate. Yes, you want to rotate. Um, that's another thing we can get into. But let's finish with the soils. Yes. Question: um, Would you suggest using one of those uh, bale uh, packages over there versus just getting chicken manure? Because I. I put my raised bed soil in, bought some bales of it, and covered it for the season. This does have chicken manure in it. I prefer it just because you get a, a you lot get of a different lot of things. Stuff. Chicken yeah. manure, you get a lot from chicken manure, but it's this instead of chicken manure and steer manure and back guano and you know they all they're all a little different. So um, you know if you get something like this, it's gonna have it's gonna give you a broader range of of supplements and and stuff for this your plants. This is giving you three different manures which is going to give you all those nutrients that you need as well as the the um the seabird feathers yeah. for breaking so I don't I don't bother just going with a straight one kind of manure anymore because I can buy a bag of yeah. something that gives me the, much all more sorts than just of stuff. Manure, yeah. And then you want to work it deep down so it gets yeah. to the, the mm-hmm. roots. And, and if, if you are, you can top dress with it. Like I sometimes do that mid season. Um, I'll, I'll put an inch or two on top. And when you have um, your critters in there, you've got worms, you've got you know, all sorts of things. They're, they're going to incorporate that. So is watering going to incorporate that into your soil. Now you do not ever want to plant directly in this. It needs to be an amendment mixed in with your soils. Uh, otherwise your plants won't grow. It's just too hot. What was that I could hear? <clears throat> you don't want to plant directly into the soil booster. Your plants won't grow. 
it's just too hot for that. It needs yeah. to be mixed it's in an amendment, an not soil. a growing yeah. soil. Yes. So then if you use something like that, like a soil booster, then do you need to Absolutely. Sometimes they'll have a trace of fertilizer to get you started, but you need to continue fertilizing. Your plants are at that stage where they're going to grow, 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 then produce their fruit. And as they're doing that, they're using up all the nutrients. So you need to keep adding those nutrients. Very important. Yes. So do you mean by soil, do you mean like the raised bed to start with and then add booster to that? Yeah, if, I, if you were, if you were pl doing raised bed this year, uh -huh. I would add fertilizers to this, and it'd be be great. If if I put this this in my beds last year, and had a bunch of uh, veggies, fruits, things growing in there that take a lot of nutrition and stuff out of it, I'd put a little soil booster in there to just kind of beef it back up. Okay. You you or you could just use more of the raised bed. Either one will work. Emulsion is good for I would not use fish emulsion because it can make things taste fishy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've had that bad experience. It's not pleasant. <laughs> well, so we're heading to fertilizer. Well, we're going to do that next. So, any more questions on soils? Okay, to these soils, we would recommend adding azomite. Azomite, I started using, oh, 12 years ago. It is trace minerals. It helps your plant save and store nutrients, so it's constantly being able to feed off of that. Very important, and it also enhances the flavor of anything edible. I, my husband couldn't believe, I couldn't believe how things changed in flavor. They were just such a strong, delicious, you started using it, didn't yeah. you? She said yeah. people come and hug her after using yeah. this and finding out how much it's, better the things it's taste. It's awesome. I and will, it's not just flavor, it adds nutrition yeah, as well. Yeah, and again, it helps them, the plants store their, their nutrients. Um, and I also, some of these come with traces of calcium. I always, with anything I plant, not just veggies, anything I plant, I use calcium as well. That's going to create good, strong cells, plant cells. So you have a good, strong, sturdy, healthy plant. Kind of like us with you know, growing our strong bones, they're going to be a nice, big, strong plant with healthy, healthy cells and vigorous growth. And again, I'm jumping into warm weather crops, but a lot of things that, that grow from a flower you have the possibility of blossom end rot and having calcium when you plant and before you plant in there is going to help prevent some, that, that from happening. And then we also have the tomato vegetable fertilizer formulated specifically for the tomato vegetables that we use. Great. And great this, is, this is all organic, um, which was what we recommend for edibles. We also have a product for vegan, and I forgot to bring it in. The box looks like this, but says yeah. vegan mix. Yeah. So obviously it's not with blood or bone meal or anything like that. With the oyster shell, can you put that on your flower gardens? Anything. anything. Any but, plant life. You, can you put it on top, or do you have to dig down? I would scra it? just scratch it in so that when you go to water, it's not going to run away from the roots. It'll go into the roots. Yeah, plus things break down better and are more available for plants if they're in the soil. If they're on top, then it's kind of more of a dry flyaway spot. So even if, if you're mulching with something, you can put your fertilizers and stuff down and then put the mulch over because that's going to keep them okay. uh, moist with the soil and okay. able to incorporate okay. better. Can we There's use our own oyster shells? Or do you, you can, but it'll there? take longer to break down. Okay. These, these, this is, this is ground up powder, like baby powder fine. So it'll take and longer. A lot of people like to add eggshells. I grew up with the eggshells, but there, again, there's over information time. online, but you need to bake them, get rid of the membrane, grind them up for them to yeah. actually be like you can't just crunch up eggshells and expect they're going to help your plants this year. Uh, agricultural lime. A lot of the plants like it sweet. Potatoes do not. So you don't use it when you're doing potatoes. But any of these other guys, uh, we tend to have acidic soil because of all of our rains here. Um, and this just but, but gets the pH a little bit higher, which makes makes these guys happier. The, the northwest soil is just naturally acidic, yeah. 
Yes. Do you add all of these together at the same time? Absolutely. Yeah. They're all organic. You don't, I, you, they give measurements. I grab handfuls. It's not going to burn anything. It's not going to kill anything. When I'm, when I'm planting in pots, I'll add it as I'm planting. Yeah. If I'm prepping my raised bed, I'm going to go and put all these things through ahead of time so then I can just plant to know yeah. that it's already there. Yeah. And then how often throughout the year? For the azomite and the calcium, just each season. Just once a season. Yeah, yeah. For the fertilizer, you know, every few weeks I, I, I add it to mine. Um, and another thing which... And the lime, you can over lime. I do not recommend using it for containers. I've tried several times to use it in my containers. They're just too small. It this this is one cup per fifty thousand oh, 50, 50, 50 square feet. <laughs> oh Imagine trying to break that down into little containers. <laughs> That's not well, and in a container, you're more in control of the soil yeah. you're using, and these soils are not going to have a pH issue at this point. It's more our native ground soil. That's really acidic. What about for a raised bed? Is it okay for a raised bed? Okay. Yeah. Again, it's it's the size. So you want to make sure you have it measured out right. And you don't use this every year. This is like every two, three years. You can overline. And if you're doing raised bed and using something like red be raised bed mix, you really don't need to do it the first year. Uh, but as it's here and getting like lots of rain leaching things through um, over time, it's going to become more acidic. Now there are going to be some diseases that happen. It's nature. It happens. It's not bad gardening is just what happens. Uh, a lot of the more common things will be mildew, um, uh, septoria, which is a fungal. You can use uh, neem oil or copper. I personally use the copper. I do a, a pre-spray, meaning when I plant them, they get a copper spray. After it rains, they get a copper spray. Every week or two, I give it a copper spray until the flower buds start, then I stop. And that will help prevent a lot of this from happening. It won't be 100%, but it'll be a lot less stress on your end. Yeah. Uh, Sorry, I, I just make sure her can say it's a copper spray? Copper. Yeah, copper fungicide. Captain Jack's ah. copper is the one I use. This one is a concentrate. I tend to myself have one of those pump up sprayers and just have some mixed in it all the time. Um, so then I, it's easy for me to just go out and do a quick spray. It's not a big production. Do make sure that you're getting the correct one. There are some copper sprays that don't have a shelf life. Yes, we when do. When you mix this up, it'll be blue. Yeah, we do carry another one that does not have a shelf life. So if you aren't going to use it all at once, the Captain Jacks, they both will start out blue, but the other one will turn brown and it's not affected when it does that. Yeah. Yeah. How safe is that for dogs that run in your yard? Uh, this is uh, yeah, safe. Yeah, I would just, you know, if you, if with any of these sprays, they're it'd be organic. great to do it when it's going to have some time to dry out. Like, it's not likely to hurt anybody, but, you know. So if your the, dog feels the need to go lick off some leaves. All the products we um, are, sh are going to show you, they are for organic gardening, and it'll say right down here in the corner. Point out the shoulder color. Uh, it's the, the beige. Right. Yeah. The, so. the ones that are synthetic are have that, a purple corner. Did you say that's a good powdery mildew? Uh, powdery mildew, septoria, a lot of the fungal, the fungal all issues. All the fungal yeah. issues. Yeah. yeah. So we talked about seeds versus starts. Um, your common pest, aphids. Aphids are insane. Aphids are born pregnant, so the minute you see one, get rid of them because all of a sudden you'll be covered with them. Um, you can do, I use Rose RX 3-in-1. I use that specifically because it covers other things that maybe I don't see those yet. <laughs> including fungal issues. <laughs> including fungal issues. Um, um, Cabbage okay, worm, BT is uh, formulated specifically for cabbage wor worms, caterpillars, uh, it's B Bacillus thunbergensis. <laughs> it's one of those <laughs> Those ones that are like literally chomping and making big holes in, in your leaves. Here, is, here's, here's an identifying difference. Slugs and snails can eat holes in the center of your leaves. Caterpillars will eat from an edge. And keep in mind, especially in the spring, 
if you see holes in the middle and we say slugs, you're going to say, no, I don't see evidence. Baby slugs don't leave trails. They, uh, don't they also do. generally hide during the day. Yes. They're, they're yes. out munching in the dark. Um, so, uh, so what was the name of that one then? Which one? The one you were just... BT? 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 It's Captain Jack's BT. Do we have Captain Jack's dead bug? Yeah. I think so. Yeah, definitely. Um, so, Captain Jack's dead bug <laughs> brew is another one that works well for those, those munching critters. Yep. And so, then, which one would be the best all around? So, you don't... I, I usually have... Captain Jack's dead bug brew um, because it'll take care of those caterpillars and some other things. I always have Rose RX, three in one, Captain Jack's, and Copper. Yeah. Those are my, my go to's. Um, Sluggo, of course, for slugs. <laughs> and as, as far as safety of these things, um, the BT and the Captain Jack's dead bug brew are, are um, Organic. Really not viruses. Oh, bacteria. Um, bacteria. Bacteria that infect just specific critters. It's not going to hurt you. It's not going to hurt, hurt your pets unless your pets are caterpillars. Um, and again, all these are for organic gardening. The sluggo. My chickens have eaten it. They used to. They used to sell, at shows demonstrate that they just eat it and they're when fine. When it first came out, they, at the garden show, they would. Snails. I wouldn't do it. <laughs> it's supposed to be safe, but I'm not putting it in my mouth. <laughs> yeah, I don't have a desire to eat it, but it hurts slugs and snails. Nobody else. So another uh, problem would be loopers <clears throat> and Rose RX or BT for that. Um, this time of year, we also have issue with wire worms. They like moist areas, and quite often they'll get into your soil. And if you end up getting wire worms, they, they eat at everything. They just, you don't want them um, on your site. Uh, Me Max can take care of that. And it comes in both a concentrate and a spray. That, yes. Would that also hurt earthworms? Um, I, you know, I'm not sure about that. I'm not sure about that. They'll be in the soil. The, they'll eat at the roots of your plants. And if you get your finger in there, they'll just be below, be below, below the surface. And they look, they're called wire worms because they look wiry. They're white and they look wiry. Huh. And it, you know, a lot of times um, when, you, when you have somebody eating at the roots of your plant, you'll see the top part of the plant going down and, and you may not know why. Because they don't, their, their roots are, are being eaten away so they can't pull up all the things that they need. Yeah. I, I would I would put it in, in soil. It can also be in the plant where it goes into the vascular system, but I'd let it drip into the soil too. <laughs> yeah, I mean you you can you can water in. Mm -hmm. So that that's where something like like the um, concentrate can be handy because you can use it in a sprayer, but you could also water it. Okay, companion plants. We kind of already did a little of that because somebody jumped ahead. I get excited. Hang it's on one of my favorites. <laughs> <laughs> you knocked out the diatomaceous earth. Oh, oh, I brought that in case there were some questions, but I can definitely use this as an, another example. You can put this in soil too for wireworms. Um, it's uh, fossilized um, ocean creatures that, when you put it in the soil, it, it, it cuts them, it kills them. You can also, I also for use like, it for carpenter ants. Yeah, if, if you have critters that get on your plants from the ground. Yep. This is very powdery, but to a, a little guy, it's, it's very sharp. sharp. Yeah. So it's going to slice up their exoskeleton, which is not good for them. Does no. that work with slugs too? It can work with slugs, yeah. Uh, otherwise, sluggo, which I did not bring a container in, but sluggo would be another great organic use. And sluggo's great too because when it gets wet, you don't have to replace it as long as you don't see it. Uh, you know, when you don't see it, that's when you replace it. If it's wet and bloated, it's still going to work. Okay, companion plant. You want to go with this one since you started it? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, there, there are you know, lots of different things you can do with companion planting. Um, one of them is intercropping. So um, one of the issues we have, um, one of the reasons that in a large 
agricultural industry, you have rows and rows and rows of the same plant. That's very easy for pest insects to find. Um, so um, they have to use sprays and stuff or their crops are going to be decim decimated. They may be organic, because you're organic veggies, they're still using something on them. Um, and that doesn't mean we won't have to use something on them if we're, we're doing these things, but if you're intercropping, and one of the reasons I made tables with kind of the different family groups of plants, um, is say, if you have brassicas, that's going to be, I mean, it's a big group, but your kale, your cabbage, cauliflower, um, a lot of these things, they're all related. They all come from the cabbage and mustard family. Yeah. Even if we're eating different parts, some of them we eat the roots, some we eat the flower buds, some we're eating the leaves, but they tend to deal with the same pests and they tend to like similar, not maybe not exact, but similar growing conditions. Um, and with those same pests that like all the different ones, if you're mixing just a bunch of brassicas, you're kind of defeating the purpose because it's still the thing that that insect wants. So we already talked about those cute little white butterflies with the black dots uh, that give us our cabbage worms, the, the little green soft caterpillars you see. Um, there is a, a theory that is still being tested um, uh, that has to do with um, them landing on plants and kind of tasting with their feet to see if it's a plant they want. So if they you land on a cabbage, they're like, oh, that's the one. They add on another cabbage and they add on another cabbage. They know in their area with plenty of food for their babies, so they're going to lay eggs underneath the leaves so their caterpillars have food to eat. If they land on a cabbage and then they land on something like a celery, they're going to go, oh, wait, this is a dull cabbage. Yeah. And it kind of breaks that cycle of wanting to lay the eggs. Um, so mixing things from different families, you don't have to plant in rows. You can, you can alternate different things in rows if you like that, that order of things. I, um, I have to try to make everything pretty. It's just what I do. So I'll put some tall things, some broccolis, some cabbages maybe on the edge so they can kind of hang out over my raised bed. I'll put carrots for some lacy stuff in there. Um, you know, s celery is another one that's that pretty and lacy. I'll maybe stick some lettuces in kind of underneath things so they can get shaded later, but they're also not a brassica. So if they land on that, it's going to tell them it's something different. So uh, there are a lot, a lo really there are a lot of reasons we're not going to touch on them at all, why you would want to mix up your plants in your garden. Um, but that's a big one for pests to not be able to find your plants as easily. And a lot of things with companion, with companion planting, you're attracting the good pests. You're, um, attracting the pollinators you're repelling or you're promoting growth and you're um, repelling the bad critters so, so that's just a lot a of those breakdown. are are uh, planting things that flower because mm -hmm. they're not only going to bring in your your honeybees and your bumblebees but they're going to bring in parasitic wasps that either eat or lay eggs in your pest critters mm -hmm. thus killing them yep. um, you're going to um, you know, bring in a, a lot of different different critters that are really going to be helpful. Um, a lot of people know um, ladybugs eat aphids. And the actual beetle ladybug does eat some aphids, but they also need the nectar from flowers. So they need a good food for, so, source for themselves. Also, they're going to lay eggs for their larva to grow up and eat aphids. They're not going to lay them if you don't have aphids. And hopefully you'll be attracting uh, lace wings and assassin bugs too. Those so, are great predators. <clears throat> Our goal in our heads is to have no aphids in our garden. You're not likely to have that. Keep in mind that you're not going to have the ladybugs laying eggs unless you have a crop you of aphids. you have food. <laughs> so one of my favorites to plant is nasturtium. Nasturtium, um, aphids love it. They'll congregate it on the back of the leaves. Um, we're not usually eating those leaves. Um, so I, I leave them there as my trap crop. I have aphids. This is, this is more enticing than some of my crops that I actually want to eat. So um, that's going to encourage things like ladybugs to lay eggs in that area because they want their babies to have food. So plant something that you don't care that the aphids are on, that is very attractive to them, like a nasturtium, and then you've got something, a reason for ladybugs to come into your garden. Now, are and nasturtiums cold weather, cold weather or? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, did, I did should. We get any no, they just started showing available, so I hopefully we'll get some for next week. 
and they continue from there. And you can see them now, too. I, there's one person that had them, but I didn't have enough to get an order in, so. Are nasturtiums kind of invasive and wouldn't be good to plant? No, they're not invasive. They'll seed themselves. Yeah. Yeah, cause we, they're easy to control, when we though. Inherited the garden, we have. See, there's a difference between the seeding themselves and being invasive. Invasive are plants that will will spread out in the wild. By root. And, or, or, seed. or seed, it can be yeah. anything. Yeah. But they take over areas where our native plants are and strangle the native plants out. That's what an, an invasive plant is. It's not from here. Usually it's something that we at some point planted in our gardens and, and let loose it. People complain about blackberries and wonder why we sell blackberries. Well, it's Himalayan blackberries are the problem. They're not you native know, birds to Birds eat them, they poop the <laughs> seeds, they grow everywhere, they strangle other things out. That's an invasive plant. Our garden blackberries aren't like that. They give us better fruit and they're not spreading all over the place. So, um, something that seeds itself is not considered invasive necessarily. And that, but it may be something if it seeds readily, you may have to do a lot of weeding them out in the places you don't want them. So they're, so they're prolific. Um, right. <laughs> um, so maybe a container would be a better way to use them? Yeah, but they will drop their seeds They'll still wherever. drop the seeds, yeah. Um, I find them so easy to identify, I don't really care. I leave the one ones where I like where they grew where they are and pull the yep. other ones out as seedlings and, and that takes care of them. Uh, you know, so there's some things we want to seed, so <laughs> we we're sprinkling them all over. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Marigolds are great because they draw, they're, they're the victim. They draw all the bad bugs to them so they leave everything else alone. They're, they're actually... They're all, all right in Washington. Oh, yeah. They're great. Yeah. And they're, they're, like, they're a triple threat. They, they have the flower. If you get one that's not a real full double and you can see that yellow center, they're attracting the pollinators. They also do attract aphids, so they're a trap crop. And, and then <laughs> in their roots, they repel harmful nematodes. So excellent, excellent plants to, to grow in amongst your veggies. Yes, they have the French variety, right? Or the oh, any any of them. Any marigold, oh, yeah, yeah, any of them. Yeah. But just keep in mind, you want one if if you're wanting to have them attract beneficial in a, insects, make sure it's one that's a little bit more of a single, or that you can see the yellow center at some point. Thank you. Um, and that goes to, for like basically anything in the aster family. Um, is is going to attract beneficial beneficial, beneficial you insects. You can say it. You're thinking things like sunflowers, <laughs> daisies, where you see that yellow disc that's actually a whole bunch of little flowers in the center. That's the aster family, and it's mm. huge. Um, so whatever you like looking at in that, that group, you can plant in there, and they're going to attract beneficials. Do you need to plant the marigolds and the nasturtiums like right next to the vegetable garden? Well, I, 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 when I would do that, I'd do it on the perimeter. So mm -hmm. it's just in the area of, and it'll yeah. attract them to Trap. them. Trap crops especially, if you put them all on the perimeter, hopefully they're going to get them before they find something else. Um, if you're wanting a marigold to repel harmful ne nematodes in the soil, it's got to be in the same soil. So we're going to show you how to plant a few things. Uh, potatoes. Uh, these are called seed potatoes, and you've got these little dimples in there. Those are their eyes. You want two to three eyes per piece. You want to cut them, I don't want to cut me, you want to cut them the day before you plant them. See how juicy that is? You don't want that in your soil that will turn to mush and rot. You want them to scab. So and this she cut yesterday. Yeah. And the scabbing goes down. Those, those little eyes are going to be your new sprouts that come up to make your plants. And I push them down pretty far. You don't want potatoes to be exposed to the sun. They can uh, cause a, they, they'll turn green and cause a bad, um, whatever I'm trying to say, uh, vi uh, bacteria. <laughs> so just push those down so the eyes are up. I already added my, my fertilizer, my calcium, and my azomite. Uh, I'm not putting lime in here because of the potatoes. Even pretending this is ground. No lime for the potatoes. Did you have a question? Yeah, just real quick. Um, why why do you only need uh, a couple eyes per planting? Why do you need a couple You want to make sure one of them is at least is going to sprout into the plant. If you have a big potato with a whole bunch of eyes on it, you put the whole thing, it's going to be a crowded mess, and it's not going to be able to do what it needs to do to get the food it needs and the water it needs and even the sunlight it needs if it's so crowded and to produce 
potatoes and and have them get any size on them. So, so if if you're buying seed potatoes and you pick out the really little ones, you know you don't really need to to cut them. But if you're getting bigger ones, you can cut them in two, three, four pieces depending on the size, just so you have eyes on every piece, and you can spread them out and give them more space to grow. From here, those eyes didn't look terribly big. They don't have to be. They don't have to be. No, nope. just uh, any dimple will will sprout. Oh, cool. okay. you, this oh, time of year, you can usually see the the yeah. bat trying Some to sprout. Some varieties are really hard to see those those eyes. I and mean, she's got a purple one because they um you you can see them a little bit better because they're little purple sprouts. And I like purple. <laughs> and they're just fun <laughs> potatoes. But um. Yeah, some of them seem a lot more smooth, and you can kind of see a dimple, but you might not really see a sprout. But that's where a sprout is going to come once it's ready to grow in the soil. So garlic. Garlic comes in bulb form. <laughs> Elephant garlic, quite often when it comes time to purchase it, it's in clove form. So this will produce one bulb. And I'm going to put that a couple inches down. Pointy end up. Pointy end up. Now, even, now the even me who doesn't cook, <laughs> I have experience pulling apart garlic cloves. Now the the bulb has lots of little cloves added to it. You just break those apart. Now each one of those bulbs is going to produce a bulb. Cloves is going to produce a bulb. Keep in mind that um, she's pulling them apart, but unlike in cooking, she's not taking all the paper off. No, paper that, needs that to gives stay us some on. Protection. Yeah. So I just think in terms of how big that bulb's going to get, and that's the spacing I give them. You can also plant them amongst other plants. They, yes. they, they're yes. more of a tall skinny, so if you have it with a lower leafy thing, they work pretty well. And Just make sure they want similar conditions. They also work as a pollinator. Can you eat the scapes of all, all You can eat the scapes, yes. The scapes grow on hard neck varieties. Now, just keep in mind, <coughs> you don't want the scapes to bloom or it'll take away all of its energy putting into the bulb formation. Bulb formation. But you don't need to cut the whole stem away either. Just go about six, eight inches down. However, the ones that we have this year that we were able to get after not getting what, what we pre-ordered, yeah. these are all soft neck, yeah. the, the, the ones that we have. So you're not going to get those scapes. But they are good for like once you harvesting and are curing them, braiding them, if that's something you're interested in doing for storage. You know, pretty pretty way to store them and, and cut the individuals off to, to so that that's a benefit with soft neck. And we we get a lot of people not sure what to do with the onion sets. So you can say it's just an onion, just a young onion, it's got all its roots, it's starting to grow. It comes in a bundle rather than in a bag looking like miniature onions. So you get like a and big bundle. And these generally have 50 plus, so there's a lot. Some people buy one bundle and share with their neighbors. Now, <laughs> I like to bury mine fairly shallow, so I go about two inches. The reason for that is I want to see how big that bulb is without having to dig it up and look. I want to see if it's time to, to pull it. So I just use my finger, go a couple inches, shove it in there, couple inches, Shove it in there. Can I say it again? A couple inches. Shove it in there. <laughs> there, there are signs on each variety that say how big they can get. Yeah. So that'll help with your spacing there too. Like if, if, if it can grow six inches, obviously you want to get them at least six inches apart. Yeah. I see you're planting them more or less right on top of each other. Is that because they have different germination times? Uh, uh, we're just using, you mean all the different things we're putting in here? Yeah. We're just using this as an example. We're not necessarily going to grow all these together. Like the potatoes are going to get big leaves. Yeah, yeah. no, this spread. is just an example. When, when I do potatoes in a pot, I only do potatoes in a I, pot. I didn't want to haul We just wanted then. some soil. <laughs> <laughs> this is uh, just soil so we can demonstrate okay. planting. Well, we, have, we have some shallots on our kitchen counter that have been there quite a while, and they're starting to grow sprouts. So should we just stick them in the ground? Go for it. Yeah. Yep. And once, as long as they're spreading, a lot of the things you get at the grocery store aren't going to do that. There's dusting that they do to prevent that, so it has a longer shelf life. Well, they're organic. But there are, yeah. See, there you go. So there are things that will start spreading. Yeah, plant them. Absolutely. <laughs> Good. Okay. If, if you have a whole bulb of garlic that's sprouting, make sure you separate them. Oh, yeah. are, otherwise, you'll have a whole bunch of sprouts <laughs> coming from the same place. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, can, you, can you plant garlic in shallots? Yes. I 
actually they're, just did. You can put them together. <laughs> they are related, yeah. so they're not going to give you those that intercropping the benefit. Thing, yeah. But they but can grow together. Yep. They, do, they, can, they don't outcompete each other. No. Okay. I also read that you could plant the garlic bulbs like underneath your apple tree, and, and it will like, or underneath other plants, and it like keep deer away. I would not recommend. <laughs> that's my <laughs> opportunity. I would not recommend planting them under a tree because they're going to compete with those roots and they're not going to create that bulb that you want. Yeah, a lot of times if, you if you're planting right right amongst trees, and probably a lot of people that have yards with with grown up trees know that where where those tree roots are, it dries out really fast, and maybe the lawn under it doesn't look as great as other places because it's sucking out all the water and the nutrition. So that you might not want to plant in ground in that spot. Yeah. Now, if you're having trouble plants. with deer, have a male adult urinate the perimeter. Okay. <laughs> this is a good organic way to do it, but it has to be a male adult. My husband, every spring, all right, where do you need me this year? <laughs> and we're in a neighborhood that you don't see our yard, so he's out there doing what he does and it's just the perimeter not in the garden itself but i have to deal with deer bear bobcat raccoons coyotes rabbits it works this is the way i grew okay. up i grew up as an organic if, if gardener if you're a man or or know a man who enjoys urinating outside <laughs> and you know there are some of you out there what about the opossum that was on the fence any of those they, we're predators to the natural life around okay. us and it has to be an adult male it can't be a young ch a young male um i you, can do it at the, i guess you your, i guess you're stinkier when you're grown up Undercover of night. Okay, we'll but, get the boys out but there. It, it really does work. I let my bunnies have my back 40 as long as they don't get in my gardening area. All right, all right. I was actually going to ask about that because we have all the same animals uh -huh. where we are. So, how often do you <laughs> Well, when it rains, you have to have them go out there again. And, a lot of, it, oh. and believe it or not, I, I get a lot of customers that come back and say, oh my God, it really works. But my husband pees in a bottle. <laughs> But it, it does really work, yeah. Uh, so after it rains, or if you're watering in that area, you obviously need to, you know, give them a beer and send them out. <laughs> <laughs> lots and lots of water. <laughs> Any more questions? Yeah, trailing things like melons, watermelons, cantaloupes. That'll be the warm when we do our warm weather class. Oh, yeah, okay. that's all warm weather. What yeah. is that, by the way? What was that? When is that, by the way? I um, forgot to look at the date. It'll probably be the end of April. Mm, I think guessing. it's farther in May. Is it in May? Because mm -hmm. I'll start bringing the plants in in, May, in the first part of May, depending she, on the weather. Depending on the weather. Over 50 at night. Yeah. It has to be consistently over. Okay, okay. so I'll just Does watch the weather. the rabbits out? Yeah, rabbits too. Oh, yeah. Like I said, I, I let my rabbits have the back 40. I love coming home, seeing them hopping around while I'm... If they're going to be hunted by a predator animal, they don't want to smell the, the that predator animals in the area. Yeah. And and that includes us. Yeah. Does it work for moles? Uh, probably not, because no. moles come Under. to you underground. Yeah. yeah. Jack, Jack Russell. Russell. Jack Russell. Oh, I'll, Jack I'll Russell. Lend you yeah. <laughs> they were bred for that. Yeah, you, are, you do a great job. <laughs> yes. Can you take some back to seeding? Can you take some of the mystery out of, out of uh, hardening off? Oh yeah. So like if if you're starting plants inside. Yeah. Okay. And um, I I really enjoy seed starting. In fact, I've got things going in the next door greenhouse because I just love it so much. Um, we play. But um, I have the whole setup with the, you know the seed trays and the proper lighting and everything. You can get fairly inexpensive LED or fluorescent grow lights. Make sure it's a grow light. They're going to have the right color spectrum for your, your seedlings. Um, and I bought them at Home Depot. Yeah, a lot of times seed packets have good information for starting in indoors. If they don't, I always refer to Johnny's Seeds. They have great information for growers. So I just look up. If I'm growing, um, I don't know, lettuce. lettuce. I'll go find a lettuce on their website and see what what their recommendation is for, for starting inside versus or whatever, and, and go by that. 
Um, hardening off, once you have your babies and you're getting close to wanting to plant them outside, um, we're finding a time like, this is a, this is a really nice day. It's warm. Um, and they're used to warm, but, you know, 60 degrees isn't necessarily as warm as, as our house is, necess- you know, depending on your house temperature. Other things it's dealing with, it's not used to the direct sun. Direct sun is different than anything yeah, you can get from a grow ball. I was going to say, don't, don't put them in it's the direct sun. It's not used to wind. It's not used to rain. Yeah. So, so a day like this, I would probably start out by putting it in a more shady spot for an hour or two, bringing it back in. Next day, maybe three hours, what bringing I, it back in. Getting it a little bit more sun, bringing it back in. So I usually do it over about a, a week. What I do is I open my garage door, and just where the sun stops... I put them there, and then as... So it's nice and bright? Yeah. So as the days go on, then it gets to go, you know... Farther farther out into the sun, getting a little bit more exposure to the winds and the rains and the sun. Um, And you'll feel it. Like, when they say hardening off, your your babies are going to be really soft. And honestly, I love touching plants, and I was given permission because (laughs) when you got them inside, if you're doing this, you're helping harden their stems. They're getting stronger stronger. from that movement. Now, what I do... Or a little, little oscillating fan... I was just going to say, Whoa, what I do at so home is I put a out. fan on them. Um, but that helps simulate some, some wind movement. And then once they get into real wind and real sun and everything, you'll feel them get harder and, and firmer. A lot of times you'll see them and they're, 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 they're coming up and they're just kind of laying sideways and you're going, oh, what's going on? It just needs to get stronger. So I, I have little fans that I put on mine at home and that just gets them wiggling and they get stronger yeah. and stronger and they stand up. Also helps keep down fungal diseases, getting yeah. some, some airflow. Air flow. You know, usually on the low, you don't want to blow them away. But <laughs> no. they just yeah, need you don't to want one that bit. just blasts If you see a little <laughs> leaf movement, that's great. Cool, thank you. Yes. I'm looking at the, the cold weather. We've got a few raised beds. Uh-huh. Um, would I then transition from these into the hot weather plants in the same beds? So basically, you can do now. that, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, or you might have things that are still going when you want to plant, and you can, you know, maybe leave some spaces for them or um, to to mix in. Just depending on the space you have to work with and what you want to grow. Like, you know, maybe I'm growing a bunch of lettuces, um, and I want to put a tomato here. I can plant that little baby tomato in there, and then as that's getting bigger, the lettuce is starting to get too warm and bitter, and then it can come out. But you can start your warm weather plants in amongst your cool weather crops for that transition time. Because they're going to be small when you're starting out anyway. Mm-hmm. Yep. Hmm. Is that it? A lot to think about. Well, we went an hour and 20 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>